Hello, CAM 121 students. I am Professor Amanda Hudson, and I'm going to be taking you through the stoichiometry of a reaction or the molarity of a solution. So let's go ahead and get started. So first, we're going to walk through the reaction. We're going to look at sort of the mechanics of it and what you're going to be seeing in lab today. So the reaction is three moles of calcium chloride solution plus two moles of sodium phosphate solution to yield one mole of calcium phosphate and six moles of sodium chloride. Okay, so we always start with a nice balanced reaction. So we have three moles to two moles to yield one mole and six moles. Okay, so first question kind of looking at what's going on here what type of reaction are we doing in lab today? Well, if we take a look at what we have, on this side we have calcium paired with chloride, and over here now we have sodium paired with chloride, and we have sodium paired with phosphate over here, and now it's paired with calcium on the product side. So it almost looks like the cations exchanged anions, and now are paired with different cations. Um, and that's exactly what is happening. So what type of reaction? This is double displacement, or what we like to call an exchange reaction, or a precipitation reaction. So over here on the side, I have a photo of what a precipitation reaction looks like. So we're mixing two aqueous solutions, which looks like a sort of nice, clear uh, solution. Um, and you mix it together and you form a solid. And that solid sort of forms and settles down at the bottom of your test tube or beaker or whatever it is you're using. So we're forming what's called an insoluble product or a precipitate. And that's where the reaction gets its name. So in the reaction today, it's designed to have each one of our trials have the same limiting reactant and the same excess reactant. So which one is which in the reaction today? Well, if you read through the lab, you'll know that our sodium phosphate is going to be an excess for the whole reaction, and our calcium chloride is going to be the limiting. So what this means is our calcium chloride is going to drive this reactant, is going to be responsible for how much of our solid product we're able to form. And that's important because when we do our calculations, we're going to be able to essentially ignore the sodium phosphate because it's an excess, and just look at the relationship between calcium chloride and the calcium phosphate we form. Okay, so you're gonna see a different lab technique that you haven't seen before. So let's kind of go over that. So what we're going to be using is a burette. So it's an instrument that vo uh, delivers volume. So it's a volume delivering device. So the word deliver is a little bit different. We've been mostly using volume containing uh, apparatus like a beaker or a flask, um, but this one is going to be delivering. So pipettes are that way. You fill the pipette with a known volume of liquid and you deliver it somewhere else. Uh, but the burette does that, but it uh, allows us to deliver um, all different kinds of volumes, not just one single volume like the pipette does. So if you take a look over here, it's a really, really tall, long, cylindrical piece of glassware. Like I wasn't even able to get the whole thing in the photo. Okay, so it has a valve at the end, which is here, which is what we see in this picture. And what's nice about this is it can deliver very small volumes of liquid. So like a fraction of a milliliter um, in size. So you can get very precise and very accurate results. And over here is sort of a blow up of what the markings look like. So we have a major marking every one milliliter, and then we have minor markings every tenth of a milliliter. So we can deliver pretty precise volumes. Okay, but one thing we have to note that when we're using the burette, we're reading volume delivered. So when we have a nice full burette, the volume should be very, very close to zero. So if you look at the diagram, zero is at the top. Okay, that means zero milliliters of liquid have been delivered into your reactant vessel. Um, and then wherever it stops, like say if it stopped right here at 25, that would mean that 
25 milliliters were delivered from the burette. So we don't read how much liquid is left in the burette. We read it as how much has left the burette or how much is delivered. So to calculate the volume that left the burette, we look at the final volume reading and then we subtract the initial. So let's have a uh, practice with that. So I have an initial and a final burette reading right here. So this one didn't get quite filled up all the way. So it's our meniscus is sort of right here. So our uh, initial volume isn't quite zero. So again, we didn't get it quite filled all the way. So let's figure out what we do have. So I see that it is between zero and one. So not quite one. So I'm gonna put that zero right here. And so my first digit is zero. Okay, so let's look at the next one. If I look at my minor markings, I see that it's, here's zero, here's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So it appears to be between 0.3 and 0.4. So we know that next value is decimal point with a three. Okay, so now we have to figure out how far between 0.3 and 0.4 it is. To me, it looks just below 0.3, so I'm going to call it 0.32. Okay, so my initial reading, again, not quite all the way up at that zero, so I have a 0.32. Okay, let's look at our final. Okay, so this was our initial burette reading. After we run our experiment, this is our final. So let's look at what our final volume reading is here. Okay, so I see that it's between 22 and 23. So again, notice we're reading this direction on the burette. So we read this direction um, for this one and we're reading the same direction from top down. Okay, so it's between 22 and 23. So I'm gonna put my 22. Okay, let's look at where it's placed between our other markings on there. So this one appears to be between 20, 22.2 and 22.3. So we know the next digit is a two. And to me, this one looks about halfway between. So I'm gonna call it 22.25. And burette reads in units of milliliters. So I'm gonna put my units and we have milliliters here. Okay, so to find out the uh, total actual volume delivered, excuse me, we're gonna take the difference between the two. So 22.25, subtract that 0.32 that uh, was our initial reading. So in actuality, 21.93. So 21.93 was our actual volume delivered. Okay, and why this is really nice, and you're gonna see in the experiment today, if your our burettes can hold 50 milliliters, we're doing two trials where we have to put in 20 milliliters to each one. Um, so what's nice is because the volume delivered for both of those is less than the total volume of the burette, we don't have to refill it each time. So we can put in our first 20 milliliters, take our initial final volumes, then we can put in our next 20 milliliters, take our initial final volumes, and then we can subtract to find out how much volume was delivered. Okay, so there's a fair amount of math that goes into the lab and we're working backwards, so let's take a look at what's going on. So our goal of the experiment is we are determining the concentration of the calcium chloride solution. Okay, so we're not exactly sure what it is. Um, we're determining uh, a known sodium phosphate, but we're not sure what the calcium chloride is. So that's our goal. And the way we're gonna do that is a little bit backwards. So we're going to uh, form a solid precipitate. We're gonna be able to filter it through filter paper, just like you saw in the separation uh, lab a few weeks ago. We're gonna be able to dry it, collect it, and weigh it to determine how much solid we formed. We can then use the solid to back calculate to find out what our concentration of calcium chloride actually was. So any sort of, I think, good stoichiometry problem should have a nice solution map, so let's take a look. 
So three steps that we're gonna go through. So the first one is we're gonna take our mass of calcium phosphate recovered in the lab and we're gonna convert that to moles. So hopefully this popped right into your mind like what exactly we need to do for that. And that one is of course, a mass over moles, so a molar mass. So that is in fact a mole there in the denominator. Mass, the scale divided by mole. And that mole is very handsome, I think. And you're probably thinking like, where is this guy? He came from my shirt. So of course he's super hip and he's dabbing, so let's go ahead. All right, so after we have our moles of calcium phosphate, we can use our stoichiometry of our reaction. So we're gonna convert moles of calcium phosphate to moles of calcium chloride. So our second arrow here, to do that, you guessed it, mole ratio. So I have a mole divided by a mole, again, our mole ratio. So if we look at our um, coefficients here, uh, we're gonna be using the three for the calcium chloride, and then this one here is a one. So we're gonna have either a one to three or a three to one. You'll have to figure that out as you set up your stoichiometry to solve for moles of calcium chloride. Okay, our last step now is we have to calculate the molarity. So molarity is a little bit of a different calculation. So remember molarity is moles, moles per volume in liter. Okay, so if we put that out, we get our moles per volume in liter, and that's our molarity. So molarity equals moles per volume in liter. So we'll have our moles that we calculated with our stoichiometry, and then the volume that came from the burette, that, those two together will give us the concentration or the molarity of the unknown calcium chloride. Okay, so let's run through one quick practice problem so you can kind of see how this math is going to work. So this one is very similar to what you're gonna to see today, but instead of calcium, it's aluminum. So we have a known sodium hydroxide solution um, we're using 90 milliliters of a 1.5 molar solution, and to it we're adding 30 milliliters of an unknown aluminum nitrate solution. Uh, we form a precipitate, which is aluminum hydroxide, and we collect 2.340 grams of that unknown. So what is the concentration or the molarity, molarity of our unknown? Okay, so if you look back at the solution map, um, the first thing we needed to do was take our mass and convert that to moles. So in order to do that, of course, we need a good molar mass. So let's calculate the molar mass of aluminum hydroxide. So we have one mass of aluminum plus three masses of oxygen and plus three masses of hydrogen to give us 78.004 grams per mole. Okay, now that we have that, we can work backwards. So again, same thing. We're starting with this and we're solving for this here. Okay, so we're gonna go grams to moles, then we're gonna do our mole ratio. So let's see, uh, next, so using the solution math, take our 2.340 grams, divide that by the molar mass, set up our mole, our mole ratio. So our mole ratio for this one wasn't super excited, it was one here and one here. So um, we got 0 0.03000 moles of aluminum nitrate were added into the solution to form that product. Okay, so we have our moles. Now it's time to calculate our molarity by taking our moles and dividing it by the volume. So we look in our problem, we had 30 milliliters of the aluminum nitrate. So we're gonna to wanna to take that and turn it into liters. Because again, remember molarity is moles per liters, or you can use units of millimoles per milliliter, but you have to have um, millimoles and milliliters or moles and liters. Okay, so the easiest thing is just to turn this into liters by dividing by 1000. So we're gonna turn that into liters. And when we do that, we can calculate our molarity. So our 0.03000, moles of aluminum nitrate divided by our 0 0.0300 liters of solution. So when we divide through, we get at one mole per, or one mole per liter. So the um, molarity of this was a one molar solution of aluminum nitrate. Okay, so this is very similar to what you're going to have to do today in lab, collecting that product, 
uh, going through your solution map to find your moles of your unknown solution of calcium chloride, and then converting that into a molarity by dividing by the volume, again, that came from the burette. Okay, so um, as you're watching the lab today, um, take careful note of those initial and final volumes on the burette. Make sure you record those property properly so you can calculate the um, total volume that was delivered from the burette. Okay, so welcome to the experiment part of the stoichiometry of a reaction. Uh, so we're going to start with part A. Part A asks you to prepare a 100 milliliters of a 0.1 sodium phosphate solution. Uh, so I have done that almost here, um, but just sort of a quick note. So the lab doesn't tell you what to lay out. Um, I calculated that uh, because sodium phosphate comes in a few different forms. Uh, we have here uh, the dodecahydrate. So if you've been studying your nomenclature, hopefully you know what a dodeca is. That means 12. So what this essentially means is this ionic compound also has 12 moles of water essentially surrounding it, or one mole of the salt has 12 moles of water. Um, so when you're calculating the mass that goes into your volumetric flask, uh, you need to take into account that you're also bringing in the weight of those 12 waters. Okay, so here it is. I'm trying to zoom in on it. Okay, so the molar mass is up here in the corner. So when you do your calculation, this is what you're using. So again, I've already calculated that out right here, but what fun is that if I tell you what I put in there? So make sure in your notebook, you do the math and figure out how much I put in here. Okay, so another thing, you kind of look, there is a nice line at the top of this. So just like our um, volumetric pipette, this is calibrated to very precisely hold 100 milliliters of a liquid plus or minus 0 0.01. So when I get the water level right up to this line, I know I have 100 milliliters. So that's right here. So I've gotten it almost all the way there. We still have some solid in the bottom that still needs to dissolve. So I'm going to take my glass sort of stopper and we're going to sort of shake this around to get the rest of it to dissolve. Looks pretty good. Okay, so I've gotten all of the sodium phosphate to dissolve and now I'm going to bring very carefully the water up to that calibration line there. I'm gonna get my water here that's the sort of ultra pure. I'm gonna very carefully add water until the meniscus just touches that line. Okay, so here then is our 0.1 uh, molar uh, sodium phosphate solution. Okay, so we'll set this aside. Uh, so the next part of the lab is we have to clean and prepare our burette for use. So the burette is here, I've already cleaned it with soap and I've already rinsed it with water. So that's what we have sort of in the bottom of the burette here is just a little bit of water. So this is gonna be my waste container here. So I'm just going to empty that out. So we don't want to dilute our unknown calcium fluoride solution at all. So what we wanna do is we want to make sure we rinse the burette with our unknown solution. This is to remove the water and to make sure the only thing in here is our calcium chloride. Okay, so here's our unknown calcium chloride. It's right here, uh, calcium fluoride solution. Bring it down, calcium chloride. Okay, so I'm gonna add this in with a funnel. All right, so hopefully, hopefully I, you know, thought ahead of time and closed the valve. We'll see. Did. Okay, so I'm gonna pour uh, some of the calcium chloride right in here. So I didn't go all the way, so I'm gonna have to drain some of this out. So I want to first kind of come in here and I'm gonna put it back on the burette stand here so you can kind of see it. I want to make sure I clean the valve. So uh, another thing that I kind of noticed with this is I can very sort of finely control how fast the liquid comes out. So I can open the valve all the way and it's streaming out. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a nice stream of liquid. So 
So I can have a slightly more uh, closed valve and I can get the liquid to drip out. So now if you kind of look, you can see it's sort of splashing down here at the bottom. Uh, it's dripping out nice and slow. So I can control, again, if you look down the splash, very, very quick. Or like I said, we can close it off and have a nice slow drip. And so that's how this works. Okay, so I've flushed the valve. So I now want to make sure that the sides of the burette are nice and coated with our unknown solution. So I'm just going to tip it um, into the sort of over my waste container. I want to make sure of the sides. So now that it's covering all of it, it's going to sort of roll it around here to make sure that calcium fluoride is fully coating that burette. Okay, so I flushed the valve, I coated the burette, so I think we're ready to fill it. So we'll get our funnel back here. So this obviously is very, very tall. So down here, this holds 50 milliliters. Down here we have the 50. Up here we have our zero. So we'll start filling this. Okay, so I overfilled it just a little bit, but that's okay because uh, we can bring some of the volume out at the end. Our, um, this way, so I'm going to get rid of these air bubbles at the top. Let me tap it a little bit. Okay, so I overshot just a little, so we're going to drain just a little. Okay, so I went a little below zero, actually. I think for more fun, let's really go below zero. Okay, so I went below zero to definitely make sure that we can read this. So this is going to be, for our first trial, our initial volume reading. So we're gonna zoom in on this. So you need to record this as the initial volume of the burettes. Okay, so we got our burette clean and prepped. Um, now we're gonna get our two samples ready to go. Okay, so we have uh, two, uh, two beakers here. Uh, so we have B and we have HA, which clearly stands for A. So we have A and B. So um, since our sodium phosphate is in excess, we don't have to you know, precisely measure this out. A graduated cylinder is going to do. Um, so we just need to make sure we get 30. So we're going to give it a nice shake, make sure we have sort of a nice even concentration. And we're going to get are 30 milliliters. Okay, so I have 30 milliliters. So you don't need to record this because it's in excess, but just so you know, we have 30. So I'm gonna put it, we're gonna start with A. So 30 milliliters goes into HA. Okay, so we have our nice 30 milliliters in here. Okay, so now we bring this closer. Uh, we need to put in about 20 milliliters. So I say about because um, we're going to record that volume. It ha if it happens to be 20.5 or 19.6, uh, that's fine. We just need to make sure we record the volume uh, as precisely as we can. So this is kind of the fun dramatic part. So watch in the beaker as the two liquids start to mix, we're gonna form the calcium phosphate precipitate. So it's gonna look you know, kind of interesting. So we'll start this and see sort of this burst of white cloud in here. That's the precipitate for me. Bring it around here. So that cloudiness that we see right in here, that's our precipitate. Okay, so I've added about half. This is kind of where we're at. You can kind of see that nice cloudiness in there. That's our precipitate. Okay, so we'll keep going. Kind of let it drop in a little more now. Let that form as we put in our unknown calcium fluoride. I know you can't really read, but we've got about 16. About 18. 19. And as we get close to 20, I'm gonna go over a little because our initial volume, oops, wrong way. Our initial volume was a little bit less than zero. Okay, so here's our first sample. 
our A, put this aside, and now we need that final pure red reading. Zoom in here, make sure we get that. So that's our final volume for our sample A. Okay. So that's sample A, so we can do the same thing. We'll might as well just go ahead with sample B, right? So we're gonna do the same thing with sample B. Now we have the B. We're gonna add our 30 milliliters of our sodium phosphate. So again, we got to have to record this, but we got our 30 milliliters. So we're going to pour it into our B beaker. We're going to do the same thing. So I haven't touched the burette at all. So we're going to go straight into the next one. So this final volume that you just recorded, that's going to be your initial volume for your second sample. So you can take that volume and just write it right on the initial volume line for our second sample. Okay, so we only have to look at the burette three times. Okay, so we're going to go, we're going to end at 40, which is right about here. So we're going to go ahead now and add uh, our uh, calcium chloride in. So same thing, get that nice uh, precipitate forming there. It looks like that kind of cloudy milky. Close the valve. And now we can record our final volume. The cigarette up. So here is our final volume for our second sample. Okay, so the next part of the lab asks us to boil our solid precipitate for five minutes to essentially drive it to completion. So that's what we have here. We have A and B, and we have about a minute left of boiling. So they're boiling, it's all nice, you can see the steam. Um, so after that, we're going to filter. So we have two funnels set up right here behind it. You can probably see it right there in the frame. Uh, but before we get in a couple of things, first you need to record the mass of our filter. So for sample A, okay, so here is the mass of just the filter paper for sample A. Okay, here's our mass of filter paper for sample B. Okay, so in order to filter, they have to fit into the funnel, so we have to fold them. Um, so I like to think about it as food. So this one I've already kind of folded, uh, but first we wanna fold it in half this way. So we're making, probably you guessed it, a taco. So here's our nice taco shell. So we fold it in half. And now we're gonna fold it in half again along the long edge here, like this. Um, I've had students say quesadilla, like going with maybe like a, that theme or pizza if you like that. Uh, but we do that and then it creates a nice pocket inside. So then it fits really nicely in the funnel. You can use just a little bit of water you stick it to the sides. Okay, so I'm going to do that with B as well and fold it in half with our little pocket. And that will go in the plastic one. Again, just a little bit of water so it sticks. Okay, so now we're ready. Again, we have A and we have B. I think I have those exactly opposite here, so maybe we'll move those. We'll put A with A and B with B. Okay, so we're ready for filtering. Uh, okay, so we're going to filter these warm. So I'm going to turn this off. Don't need uh, boiling. Uh, get some sort of dope oven mitts for uh, handling a hot thing. Like, these are awful. There's two left hands. There we go, I guess we're using this one. All right, so touch super oven chemistry bits. Okay, so we're starting with A. Uh, actually, we'll start with B. Okay, so we want to uh, filter this 
right here into these things are not at all awkward, so that's good. And we're getting our liquid nice and dripping in. And we're trapping our solid in the filter paper. So I'll let that one go. Then we were supposed to rinse this. Okay, so I don't want to. I'm going to rinse my uh, with just some water right here. Um, so I want to make sure, make sure I get all of the solid. So our sample A looks like it's about ready to go in the oven. So I want to kind of let you look at kind of inside the funnel what that looks like. So for our sample B, this one's still going. You kind of see the solid on the side and it has some liquid in there. So that one's still going. It's still dripping pretty good. Um, sample A is about done. So that one is over here. So there's a little tiny bit of water in there, but we're just going to put it in the oven and evaporate that out. And you kind of look, the solid looks kind of shiny in there on the filter paper. It's shiny, glossy, it's kind of a fine powdery. So we're going to get sample A into the oven um, to get that water evaporating off. Okay, so sample A is going to go on this watch glass. And I'm just going to use a little scoopula here to carefully get the filter paper on the funnel. I'm going to lift it. And I'm going to place it right here on the little watch glass and I'm going to put it into the dry oven here. So our drying oven is set at 110 so it should drive off all of the water and leave us with just the solid left. So I'm going to let B uh, keep uh, filtering uh, through and then I'm going to get it into the drying oven as well and then we'll get our final masses. So both of the samples are now in the oven and they are drying and we will come back and check on them in about 30 minutes. Hey, okay, happy drying samples. Our sample A just came out of the oven. So here we are, sample A, nice and dry. So I'm going to let it cool for about five or so minutes and then I'm going to take it over to the scales and get our final mass. So our last and final step is to obtain our final masses. So I have our sample A and our sample B nice and dry from the oven. They've cooled down and they're ready to weigh. So I'm going to use the balance uh, to get those final weights. So first thing I want to do, since it has a mass already reading, I want to what's called tear the scale. So I'm going to reset the scale to zero, pushing the tear button. So now it's reading zero point all those zeros grams. Uh, so you might notice this scale has one, two, three, four decimal places. So that initial mass of our filter paper, those ones did include that fourth decimal place. Okay, so this is sample A. So we look on there, there's our A. So we'll put it in, we'll close the door. And now we have our final mass of sample A. So make sure you record this. This is the mass of the calcium phosphate and the filter paper. Okay, so that's sample A. Okay, we'll bring this one out. Make sure we're still teared. Okay, we changed just a little bit, so I'm gonna tear it again. Oh, here we go. So now it's ready for sample B. So this one is B, we're gonna slide that one in. Close the door. And this is the final mass of our sample B. So sample B is right here. Okay, so in case you were sort of curious, now we got our masses. I mean, I didn't want to open this up really. Um, and just for the 
um, fear of losing. So this was our sample A. I do want to see if we can maybe zoom in. Uh, this is what our solid looks like. It's kind of real flaky um, and uh, it mostly has stuck to the paper. Uh, but here's a nice close-up of what we have. So I'll put like a little paper towel down here, um, but we can kind of flake it off and kind of see that it did dry all nice on that paper there. Sample B looks pretty similar. Okay, so that is the end of our uh, molarity of a solution. So now run through those calculations and determine that uh, concentration of unknown calcium chloride solution.